All right, so welcome to the second class of uh, Methods of Experimental Psychology. So I will actually not have to pass out the sign-in sheet today because we are going to be doing our experiment. You'll be handing in your responses so that I can analyze those. So uh, before we begin, uh, I just want to um, point out that what we're doing in here today is going to be part of what we're going to write up for this uh, class as your final research paper. So we're gonna write up an experiment that we perform. Today is when you're gonna participate in that experiment as subject so that we can get data, so that we can do the method, do the results, and do the entire write-up. So this is the first part of writing your final research paper is participating in the experiment today. So what we will do is I will hand out these sheets uh, for you to uh, fill in. It's a memory experiment, so you will see words projected on the screen, and then when given the prompts, you'll try to remember as many of those words as you possibly can. But uh, the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing randomization. So this, for our purposes, in, uh, involves splitting everybody up into groups. So you'll read more about randomization as we go through this uh, course. But in any experiment, uh, when you are um, isolating a particular variable, when you're looking at a particular cause, you want to make sure that that is the only difference between the groups in your experiment. And because human beings are just so varied, because there's so many things that could account for differences in behavior, the one way that you can make sure that your groups are equal is to just randomly put people together uh, into those different groups. So that's what we're going to be doing first. All right, so let's take a moment to read the instructions here. Okay, so in this experiment, you will read a list of words, and you will then be asked to recall as many words as you can. So you're trying to remember as many words from the list uh, that you can. Uh, you'll be working together in your designated groups. So again, any strategy you want to employ, work together to try to get as many words as you possibly can. Uh, one thing is that you'll see if you turn to the second page, it says that that is where the words for list number one will go. The one uh, criteria that we need to meet is that the list is the same for everyone. So you will have time to recall the words. During that time, work together to agree upon what goes into this list. So if one person has 14 words remembered and the other person only has 10, you have to come to some sort of agreement. Do you, does the other person add four words? Do you, do you cross them out? Whatever it is, your lists have to be the same. So we're looking at the list you can come up with as a group. All right, so you'll be asked to recall as many words as you can. A countdown will indicate when each new list will begin. So there's six lists in total that we're gonna be looking at in this experiment, and it will let you know when the recall period begins and when each new list is uh, going to begin. So during the recall period, you're gonna get two minutes for recall, uh, you might write down the words in any order that you like. So this isn't about getting the words in order, it's just about getting as many words as you possibly can. Then during that recall period, I will also ask you to judge your confidence in your response using a scale of one to four. So you'll notice beside where you write your words, there's another column here that says confidence one through four. For each word, you're gonna wanna rate how confident you were that the word was on the list. So you're gonna rate it from one to four. A one means that you are not very sure, and a four means that you're absolutely sure that the word was on the list. So if you remember that word on the list, you put a four next to it. If you were totally guessing and you're like, well, I think a computer was on there, I have no idea, but let's just write it down. Then you put a one next to that. So you have one column of recall, and then one column of how sure are you that those words were actually on the list. So uh, once the countdown um, recall time is over, the next list will start. There are six lists in total, uh, and we'll work through all of those for the experiment. 
Any questions before we begin? All right, let's get ready. Okay, so this is the countdown. These aren't the things you're trying to remember. <laughs> And remember, only write them down during the recall period. You got two minutes, recall as many words as you can, work with your group. Uh, everybody has to have the same final list. So, again, also remember how confident you are. One means not at all confident that the word was on the list you just saw. Four means absolutely sure that you would be. Yes. Okay. So um, for the confidence levels, this is a good question. They also have to agree. So if somebody's at a four and somebody else is at a one, decide what the final number should be for the group as a whole. All right, you got 30 seconds left. List number one. Well, you can. You'll have a little bit of time to get back to it. But list number two is on its way.
seconds left.
get ready for list number five. <laughs> Get ready for your final list.
settings left. So that is the uh, end of the experiment. So at this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about two minutes. And what I would like you to do is just check over your lists and uh, do the following. Make sure that there is one unified list so that everyone has the same list. So if you find any discrepancies, now is the time to just kind of make any final decisions on that. And then two, make sure that your confidence ratings are also uh, in agreement and that you have confidence ratings for all of the lists. And I'll give you about two minutes just to finalize that, and then we'll continue on with the experiment. All right, looks like the groups are done. So what we're gonna do right now is, um, we're going to begin our analysis of this uh, data. So this is the experiment that we ran. We generated data. People have written down uh, lists of words. They've written down confidence. And uh, in the, in the uh, format that it's in right now, no human scientist could ever make sense of, of everything. So we had, I believe it was 16 uh, word per list times six lists. That's what, 96 words times uh, one, two, three, four, five groups. Uh, you're looking at 480 uh, words multiplied by, I have done this in different sections. You get up to about 10,000 words and it's hard to wrap your mind around what does that all mean. So one way to get around that in experimental psychology is to use measures of the concept that you're trying to uh, look at. So we want to look at memory and how good are, was everybody's memory, how well did they do. So we need to boil down these words to numbers that measure that, uh, that memory. So that's what we're going to do right now with scoring and analysis. So I'm going to pass these out and the first thing that I want everybody to do is put your name on the front page and then this is what you're going to hand in so that I can analyze the results so that we'll have data for our final experiment and also this is going to count as your uh, attendance uh, sign in for today so that I know you are here with us all right so put your name on the front and then if you, uh, whoops, if you turn to the back, before we get to that, if you turn to the uh, second page there, if you can just fill out the uh, group ID, so either group one, group two, if you remember the number you were, or if you don't, just make a name up for your group. But this is the way that when I have these sheets of paper, uh, if they get jumbled, I'll know who was in which group with everybody else. And then um, if you can just put some demographic information, your age and your sex, um, this is something that uh, typically when an experiment is reported, they want to know that information in just about every single journal. So whenever an experiment is reported, you report the subject characteristics and that lets people know who was in this particular experiment. And usually the bare minimum that a journal requires is what was the age of your participants and what was the sex or gender of your participants. So you can imagine that this experiment that we just did was going to be a lot different if the average age of subjects is 20 something versus if the average age of subjects was 70 versus if the average age of subjects was, you know, two and a half years, right? Very different results would occur. So usually in any experimental report, in our experimental report, you have a section where you describe where your subjects' uh, characteristics were and where they came from. So make sure that you have that information there as well. In this experiment, we're not interested in age differences or age effects. We're not interested in, in gender differences or gender effects, but it's something that needs to be known so that you can critically evaluate uh, scientific information. All right, so then we get to the meat of 
the actual results that we have. So for each group, what we're going to do is we're going to now go through our list. Now I'm going to ask you to count up the number of words that you correctly recall. So I'm going to put up a list in just a moment. And I just want you to go through that and basically grade your responses. Put a check mark next to uh, each one that is correct. So you're going to count up the words uh, correctly recalled. This number should be the same for each person. So everybody has the same list at this point, so you should have the same uh, number correct. And then what you're going to do is you're going to enter that on the scoring and analysis page in the space labeled number correctly recalled. So you'll see that little section, uh, that little line right there. That's where you put in the number that you correctly recall. So uh, for this, plural forms, conjugations, misspellings are accepted as correct. So if the word was um, if the word was bed and you wrote beds, that's fine. If the word was uh, mountain and you misspelled mountain, that's fine. Uh, conjugation, if the word was rock and you put rocking, that's fine as well. Um, all of those are accepted, but for reasons that will become apparent in just a moment, synonyms are not accepted. So if the word was um, tart and uh, you put um, Sour was already up there. <laughs> if you put tart and sour, those don't count as the same. Those are two different. So synonyms, two different words. So synonyms are not uh, accepted. All right, so there are the lists. So list number one, table, sit, legs, seat, couch, desk, recliner, sofa, wood, cushion, swivel, stool, sitting, uh, rocking, and uh, bench. So again, if you put uh, swiveling instead of swivel, uh, if you, uh, you know, put uh, one L, one M, if you put one L, if you put one M on summit, it, it counts as correct. But uh, if you put, um, uh, if instead of hurt, you put injured, that doesn't count. All right, so go through these. Uh, and what I would recommend is that for each list, get a number out of 14, 15, sorry, there's 15 words. So get a number out of 15 for each list. And then at the end, just tally up uh, all the words uh, that you got correct across the six lists. So if your memory was perfect, you'll end up with a score of 90. Uh, if you were asleep, you'll end up with a score of zero. And then somewhere in between there will be the score for your particular group. And uh, while you're working on that, if there is a word that you're not sure as to whether or not it should count or it shouldn't count, in that case, call me over. I'll make the final determination so that we can get this all tallied up.
uh, one of my courses where I had to hand grade quizzes, and uh, I realized that students were getting most of them right, so I would just subtract the ones from the actual numbers. Oh, yeah. All right, so it looks like um, uh, some groups are uh, finished, uh, others are getting very close to finished. So just in the um, interest of time, we'll also mention, uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next step. And uh, for the next step, this is uh, for each word that you correctly recall. So now that you have identified which words are the correct words, now what you want to do is you want to add up your confidence ratings for those words. And again, this should be the same for each person uh, in the group. So you're going to enter this on the scoring and analysis page in the total correct confidence rating uh, line right there. So there are the words again if you still have to finalize those lists. But if you got all 90 words, and you are 100% confident about each of them, then that'll be four times 90, that'll give you 360 in terms of your total confidence. If you didn't get any words, then your confidence level is zero because you didn't write down any words, but it'll be somewhere in between those. So if you got 50 words, but you're only on average confidence of two, you'll have a score of uh, 100 for your total confidence. So work on that. And then uh, don't go on to the critical items because those have a very specific definition, and I'll, we'll uh, do that in just a moment.
right, so before we get to the next step, uh, I just want to ask uh, everybody here, did anybody notice anything unusual about the lists? Anything maybe a little weird about the lists? Mm -hmm. Is that all about the theme? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so these lists all have uh, a shared theme. They all kind of revolve around one idea or one uh, particular word. And uh, importantly, that word is not present. So this, these lists came from a very influential study and they've been used a lot in psychology research because each of these lists has words that, is, that are associated with a particular word, but, are, but that word is not actually uh, there. We're gonna see what those words are in just a moment, but this was, uh, this was uh, based on the experiment that uh, showed uh, the, the existence of false memories. So up until that point in psychology, a lot had been done on memories, a lot had been done on memory research, and the idea was that uh, memories in your mind work like a filing cabinet. And when you try to remember something, or when you see something and you form a memory, you write down that event on a file, and you take that file, and you put it into your filing cabinet, and then later on, when you want to remember something, you, in your mind, go to your filing cabinet, and you look it up, and you say, oh, hey, there it is. Oh, I remember, you know, we went to the park on that, you know, summer's day. Now, uh, that model was used to explain a lot of things in memory. So, for example, if you misfiled your memory, then when you went there, you'd be like, oh, no, I don't remember what happened. I can't remember that day. If you had brain injury and your file was destroyed, you went there and you're like, oh, no, I don't have that memory anymore. So it helped to explain how we remember certain things and it helped to explain how we forgot certain things. But one thing that it didn't allow for was the idea of false memory. So this experiment showed that not only can we forget things that had happened in the past, but it was revolutionary because it showed also that we can remember things that never actually happened. We can remember things that are false memories. And because of that, the idea of the filing cabinet model for memory got thrown out. And instead, this idea of a reconstructive memory process came in. And that's the idea that whenever we try to remember something, we get pieces from all over our mind and we put them all together and we form that memory. And if the pieces somehow form an incomplete picture, we will fill in stuff that might be missing, like many of the groups here probably filled in that word that was missing. So that's the topic that we're gonna be looking at in our experimental paper. We're gonna be looking at false memories and just as a foreshadowing, we're also gonna be looking at the effects of groups on false memories. So everybody in this section of this class either ran this experiment, a group of two or a group of three. I'm gonna combine that data with other classes that I ran this experiment in that had group sizes of just one individual. They ran it uh, alone. So we're gonna be able to see, are you more susceptible to false memory uh, when you're alone or are you more susceptible when you're in a group? Do you remember more words when you're working in a group? Are two heads really better than one? And what's your confidence like for memories when you're in a group versus when you're uh, individual? Uh, is there a way to tell the difference between a real memory and a false memory by, via your confidence levels? Are we more confident for real memories than we are for false memories? So all of those questions will be answered when we take a look at the data. But for now, we need to find out how many false memories did we have? So for this, you're gonna count up the number of critical items recalled. And in this experimental design, critical items are the words that the lists were designed around, but were not in the actual presented words. So count up the number of critical items that you recall. This should be the same for each person. You're gonna enter this in the scoring and analysis page in the space labeled number of critical items recall. And once again, plural forms, conjugations, misspellings of these critical items are accepted. However, for now, you can see why it's uh, necessary that synonyms are not counted because many of these words are synonyms 
for this critical word. All right, so here they are without further ado. List number one, chair. Every word had something to do with the word chair, but chair was not on the list. So if you wrote down chair, you have uh, experienced a false memory. Uh, list number two, needle. Everything had something to do with needle. Needle was not there. If you wrote down needle, false memory. List number three, mountain. List number four, rough. List number five, sleep. And list number six was sweet. And I actually heard murmurs where people were like, sweet wasn't on the list, it wasn't on the list, sweet wasn't there. Sweet is a false memory. All right, so you're either gonna have a score of zero if you didn't uh, produce any false memories, all the way up to a score of six for those false memories. And then uh, just because this won't take uh, very long at all, I'll just let you also know that we're gonna total up the confidence levels for those false memories as well. So once again, identify the false memories and then total up the confidence level for that. If you wrote down all six critical items and you were completely confident about each one, your confidence level should be 24. If you wrote down all six and you were completely unsure about them, your confidence level would be six, right? So one plus one plus one. So wherever it is, uh, write that down in the, uh, in the slot that says total critical item confidence rating. What was that? Like if we put that name on the list, did make it right? What do you mean? Like I put needle, then she yelled. Well, was I technically right? <laughs> well, it's a false memory. But but it's associated. It's word associated. It is. It is. And this is one of the things that we're going to take a look at when we take a look at false memories. Um, is basically how are they formed? So what is it about? We're, we'll read research about what is it about these lists that make you form these false memories. And this is something that has become very, very important because in our current sort of information age, there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. There's a lot of missing information that's out there. And people are having false memories at uh, alarming rates. So, um, you know, you can see this in the spread of conspiracy theories that were almost gone, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. All of a sudden, um, you know, people believe that, they're, that the earth is flat again. I mean, that, that belief was gone in the 1500s and somehow it's come back. Um, you know, people believing in uh, other conspiracy theories, um, people having false beliefs about science, about climate change, about vaccination. All of this came recently and it's all somewhat based on false memories. It's based on kind of like, hey, I kind of remember that. And they've done studies, just to sort of tie this a little bit to the real world, they've done studies about how it's actually harmful to share um, news stories and point them out as false, right? So if you, if you uh, read a news story and you're like, oh my gosh, this is blatantly biased or blatantly fake, and you share it on your social media post and say, look at how biased this news item is, you've actually done less for battling that false item and more for propagating it because people will forget parts of where that uh, memory came from, i.e. They, they mentioned that it was false and they'll remember the actual uh, portion of it. So this kind of work is, is uh, becoming more and more important answering these kinds of questions. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking at it in this particular uh, class. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we're running this in groups because also for the first time, uh, our memories have become very, very social. So uh, I don't know uh, how many times, I can't count it, where I've been watching a, uh, a TV show and somebody will mention a name or they'll make a reference. And I kind of remember it, but I don't really. So I just pause the, uh, you know, the playback and I'll go onto my phone and I'll Google the name or I'll Google the reference. And I'm relying on group memory. I'm relying on somebody else's recollection of this to let me know who this person was or what that event was. So our memory is becoming more social. So experiments like this that kind of delve into what happens with our confidence for these memories, now that we're rem remembering things in group, uh, groups can become very, very uh, important. 
All right, so um, I think it looks like just about everybody's finished up. So one last thing that I'll mention before we wrap up for today, and uh, I've kind of touched on it already. One of the things that uh, you should try to keep in mind as we go through this methods of experimental psychology is uh, linking what we do in the lab to what we do in the real world. And sometimes that connection can get lost, especially if you're struggling with uh, reading research reports that talk about 16 lists, uh, sorry, six lists and five words per list and randomized across different, sometimes it gets down to like very nitty gritty stuff. And in all honesty, most of what happens in the lab is not important on its own. And I'll explain what that what I mean by that. So I right now got some of you to write down the word chair, where chair was never actually presented. I got some of you to write down the word sweet, and sweet was never presented. If that's where this story ends, I have a nice little parlor trick that I could probably bring out at dinner parties and be like, ooh, did you write down sweet? Ah, I got you, you know, look at the magic. Um, and that's it, that's where it ends. That's what happens in the lab. The real power of experimental psychology is going from that lab and making conclusions about the real world. So the fact that I got you to write down the word sweet, that's, that's what, 30 seconds of, uh, you know, of, of wow. I can't believe I wrote down sweet. But what this has to say about our society and the way that we're moving and what we remember and how we remember things in a group setting and what about the information age and what about responsible journalism and what about the dissemination of science and how should we, you know, all these kind of big movements and all these sort of big questions, we shed light on them as psychologists, sometimes with just lists of words, you know, projected on a screen in a room. So as you go through this, sometimes you might be reading about an experiment and think to yourself, what's the big deal? And it's up to you as a critical thinking individual to try to make those connections and say, all right, lists of words, well, what is the big deal? Oh my gosh, false memories exist. Oh my gosh, they work like this in group settings. What does that mean for the world at large? All right, so that's all that I wanted to uh, do for today. Any final questions or comments, anything? We good? All right, so uh, finish up if you haven't already uh, your scoring and analysis. Make sure your name's on the front. Uh, bring it up and just uh, drop it off here on the table. And that is it for today. No. Uh, so one last thing before you uh, before you go. Hang on to your booklet, and that'll help jog your memory later on in the semester when we're writing this up. It'll just kind of help you remember what it was that we did. I will also post these lecture slides exactly the way that they are in class today. I didn't do it before class for obvious reasons. I will post these now so that you'll also have access to these, again, to help you jog your memory when we're getting around to writing up that final report. All right.